I very much want to welcome you to Columbia uh, University. I'm Victoria de Grazia. I'm a, a professor of history, European history, contemporary history, and I'm also the director of the European Institute, Columbia's uh, institute that focuses on the European region, the oldest in the United States because it was set up in the late 1940s uh, to prepare expertise for the Marshall Plan and NATO. And I especially welcome you here. Uh, it's, it's very unusual. We get a, a crowd of the size coming in when we hear that 125 people have responded. Now, this is Colombia. This is not Italy. We usually assume that 70 will come, but here you are, <laughs> serious, serious Europeans and others. What I'd like to start by this evening, which is introducing the speakers um, for the Queen Wilhelmina Chair by introducing Martha Howell, uh, who is the Miriam Champion Professor of History, an expert on uh, Dutch, uh, Flemish, Belgian, Northern French, uh, early modern history, and she will speak about uh, what the chair does uh, and welcome you all, many of you who are in some ways supporters of the chair. So Martha, and then I'll come back and introduce uh, the speakers. Thank you. So thank you, Victoria. Um, uh, well, of course, I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight, and I'm delighted to just take one minute to tell you about the program that makes this evening and our program of studies of the Dutch-speaking world at Columbia possible. For about a decade, we've been supported by the Nederlands Taal Unie, which has allowed us, uh, which is a, a joint Flemish-Dutch program to promote the study of the language, culture, history, and society of the Dutch-speaking world. The financial support they provided has allowed us to develop a very rich curriculum of language study, but also to uh, build a curriculum that's mostly in history and art history on the Dutch-speaking world, and then to sponsor new scholarship by our graduate students, some of our faculty, and indeed graduate students in the region who see Columbia as a resource for studies of the Dutch-speaking world. It is thanks to that support that we're able to have with us this semester Professor Renoy Kahn and Schnabel, who are teaching a fabulous course, a seminar for advanced students called The Idea of Europe, The View from the Netherlands. And uh, some of the questions that they're be investigating in this seminar are the inspiration for the idea for this evening. And I'm sure that some of the people in the audience are members of that seminar, so I welcome you. Um, we are indebted for this evening not only to the Nederlands Taal Unie, but also to two of our distinguished guests. Uh, first, the new director of the Flanders House in Belgium, or, or that's representing the Flemish state in Belgium. It's very complicated, your politics, right? <laughs> Mr. Gert de Prost, so thank you very much. Yeah. And I, I've, oh, there we are. Yes, and I've also, uh, we have support, uh, strong support from the Dutch consulate, and we have the consul general with us tonight, Mr. Rob de Vos. So thank you very much. <laughs> now, of course, I'm. Um, extremely delighted with the financial support we've received, but I'm particularly pleased to, about your interest in our program and about your presence here tonight. So I'm sure you'll enjoy it, and I will now turn it over to the people who are really gonna do the program, and I'll let Vicki introduce them. So this evening we decided to speak about how fragile is Europe, and that can be pronounced is in a kind of interlocutory way, doesn't presuppose that it is fragile. So this was a question that's posed, and we posed it of our speakers, uh, the very distinguished colleagues who are visiting here in the capacity of the Queen Wilhelmina Chair, Alexander Renoy Khan, who's a university professor of economics and business at the University of Amsterdam, and this year indeed, this semester, visiting professor of the Queen Wilhelmina Chair. Um, professor Renoy Khan studied mathematics 
in Leiden and econometrics in Amsterdam, and he's held academic positions at a number of universities, including Delft, University of Technology, and Erasmus University of Rotterdam. At Erasmus University Rosbert, Rotterdam, he was appointed professor of operational research in 1980 before becoming director of the Econometrics Institute in 1983 and rector magnificus in 1986. Now, this belies that he is profoundly a humanist. Uh, he has been a visiting professor at Berkeley, MIT, and the Wharton School, so he knows well, he's acquainted very well with the transatlantic uh, world. And Paul Schnabel is University Professor of Sociology at Utrecht, uh, also the Queen Wilhelmina Chair. It's an unusual that we were able to share the position this year. Uh, that's thanks to their suggestion. Uh, Professor Schnabel served as General Director of the Netherlands Institute for Social Research and advisor to the Dutch Cabinet uh, from 1998 to 2013. Earlier appointments include Dean of the Netherlands School of Public Health and Research Director of the Netherlands Institute of Mental Health and Addiction. In 1986, he was appointed Professor of Clinical Psychology and Mental Health at Utrecht and in 2002, Distinguished Professor. Um, uh, his research interests focus on the welfare state issues, the topic of today's discussion. Uh, and in Europe and the Netherlands, modern conservatism and politics and the social and cultural history of the <coughs> Netherlands. As discussants this uh, evening, we have a uh, colleague, Sherry Berman, <coughs> who's Professor of Political Science at Barnard College at Columbia University. Uh, professor Berman is a professor of political science uh, with wide interests in European politics and political history, which makes her very unusual. She's a um, hands-on uh, uh, political scientist. She's very interested in democratization and democracy, social democracy in Europe, and the impact uh, of globalization on the history of the left and on social democracy. And her two books um, uh, deal with these uh, questions, the question of the history of social democracy, one of the only histories which covers the arc of the 20th century. I'm very pleased also to welcome as guest this evening, Wim Blockman. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of Leiden and Emeritus Rector at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. But two years ago, he was the Wilhelmina visiting professor here and I was able to host him in my home with his wonderful dog. Wim <laughs> is study history at the University of Ghent where he obtained his PhD. Uh, he served as professor of medieval history at Leiden, rector of the Netherlands Institute, as I've said, and he has very wide research interests in medieval history, political, economic, and social and culture of Flanders, but also more wide ranging. It's a tribute to him that he invented, reinvented this course on the idea of Europe, uh, which our colleagues are uh, uh, continuing this year. He's a member of many academies the British, the Royal Historical Society, and the Royal Netherlands uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences. I also get to comment in my role as a professor of history and uh, 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 director of the institute. So we'll start with Paul. Yes. So, well, thank you very much, Professor Grazia. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Yeah, our question is how fragile is Europe? And if we look back, maybe just about 10 years ago, 2004, this really was a question that would not have come up. The euro had successfully replaced the majority of national currencies in the European Union, no longer German marks, French francs, Italian liras or Dutch guilders, no longer the, always the hassle with changing money in passing the European borders. And even the same year, in 2004, the European Union was getting stronger and bigger, welcoming in that year a whole lot of new members more than eagerly to get in the European Union. It's maybe good to remember that nearly half of the present 28 member states made their entrance in the Union in that year. And even today, five to six countries, six if Turkey is still interested in joining, which is really debatable, of course, at the moment, but five or six countries are actively applying for membership in the Union or in the Eurozone. 
So fragility is certainly not the first thing that comes today to mind if you look just at the figures. The European Union is home to half a billion people. Its GDP amounts to 18,000 billion dollars. I think that must be something like, what is it, 18 trillion? Unimaginable, unimaginable. Un and that's 18,000 billion dollars, nearly one third of the world's GDP. It's more than 50% higher than the GDP of the USA and more than three times the GDP of China. If you just would see European Union as a federal state, it would by now be by and large the prime economic power of the world. And yet there is this pervasive feeling inside and outside the European Union that the EU is much less robust than the figures suggest. At the peak of the international economic crisis, there were no longer a scenario seemed unsinkable in which the Union would fall apart. The economically more successful countries in the north and west of Europe might separate themselves from the economically ailing countries in the south and east. There was another scenario that foresaw an end to the Eurozone and a return to a system of national currencies. And in all these scenarios, the United Kingdom played the role of the odd one out. And although none of these scenarios have become reality, there still remains a fair chance that the UK will leave the European Union. But paradoxically and ironically at the same time, that will then automatically include Scotland, although in Scotland the near majority would rather have left the United Kingdom, keep the pound and remain a member of the European Union. And a somewhat different scenario was envisaged by the leaders of Catalonia in Barcelona, independence from Spain, but immediately a complete membership of the European Union and of the Eurozone. So, how fragile are we? But still, the past years have been a permanent stress test for the European Union and for the Eurozone. The problems are not over, but they have certainly not worsened, even though rumors of a triple dip, a new recession, were heard as last week's annual meeting of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. May that be the case, and I hope, of course, that this will not be really the case, that we will have a triple dip. One still may argue that compared to the start of its predecessor four years ago, the new European Commission, led by Jean-Claude Juncker, enjoys again more competences than its predecessor. It has been repeatedly noted before, it is one of the interesting aspects of the European Union. The European Union practically needs a crisis to make fast and irrefutable steps toward, uh, towards a further economic and political integration. Especially times of crisis are helpful to that. And it is a saying these days that under pressure everything becomes fluid, but it is probably more true in the case of the European Union to say that under pressure things tend to stick together. To overcome the problems, more cooperation, more integration and more delegation of power to a supranational body is unavoidable and the member states, although always reluctantly, act accordingly. A higher level of communal, of communal resilience is the outcome of strengthening the ties. Fragility will be the result from separating yourself from the other member states. Once you are in the EU, there is actually no turning back and I guess that at least David Cameron himself is very much aware of that. The fragility of the European Union is mainly due to the dwindling electoral support for the EU and its efforts to overcome the crisis. Even in the countries like the Netherlands that might be seen as the founding fathers of the whole idea of European integration, the support for the EU, the belief in its effectiveness and the faith in its institutions has gone down substantially. Some see this as proof of the democratic deficit of the EU. Others hold to the view that the European integration has been too long a project, project of a cosmopolitan elite never bothering to connect with the general population. And today we are confronted in the European Union with a growing and quite fierce populist backlash, a general attitude of distrust 
towards everything coming out of Brussels and a feeling of resentment towards national politicians squandering the nation's wealth and betraying their electorate by handing over national responsibilities to a distant and uncontrollable bureaucracy. I collected some figures to show you the changes in sentiment in the member states, but with looking at the time we have tonight, I will leave that out. But I will just give, put your interest in one, uh, one specific figure, uh, in research done by my own institute, the Netherlands Institute for Social Research, that shows that a rejection of the EU membership is highly correlated with a low level of information is a low level of information about the European institutions and about its handlings. So there is a very strong connection between level of education and, you could say, tolerance, acceptance and um, interest in the European Union. There's a typical Dutch aspect in that sense that the le level of information on the subject is remarkably low in the Netherlands, but typically for the Dutch people consider themselves generally as very well informed. <laughs> so, to put it otherwise, they don't know that they don't know and they don't feel the need for more information. Most people who feel negative about the European Union are not, however, in favor of leaving the Union altogether. In many cases, they are as critical of their own government without opting for new elections, let alone for the discontinuance of their own country as an independent state. But the elections for the European Parliament, however, are invariably seen as a re referendum for or against remaining in the European Union. It's not, of course, but the legitimacy of more correct legitimation of the European Union as a federation or confederation in progress is severely jeopardized by this ongoing loss of trust in the whole process. It's easy, it's too easy, I would say, to blame the people who have serious doubts about the whole idea of a federal Europe for their apparent lack of insight. Actually, that's my point, we might better blame the real proponents and advocates of more and faster federalization for their lack of understanding the reservations hold by many of their compatriots. Even for the six founding fathers of the European Union, it's hardly half a century ago that they decided to join economic forces. For the majority of the member states, it is less than 25 years or even just 10 years ago that they passed the difficult and all encompassing test of the acquis communautaire, all the things that are part of the European Union and that you have to accept to become a member. Croatia entered just last year the Union, and Lithuania will now soon enter the Eurozone as its 19th member. And it is in light of that kind of uh, data, the recent history we have, it's, un it's understandably that many people worry about the astonishing rate of expansion of the European Union. They worry about the cost involved in helping the poorer newcomers in their economic de development, in building a better infrastructure. And even though the Commission's budget is not yet 1% of the Union's collective GDP, people feel that money is, is squandered and money is, is, is going down the drain, that it costs too much. But on the other hand, the budget of the Dutch government alone is more than twice of that of the European Union. And it covers not 1% of our GDP, but 45% of Dutch GDP. Most worried are people in the established member states of Western Europe over the free movement of persons, one of the main principles of the EU. They fear the influx of a cheap, but well-trained and hard-working labor force from the, especially the countries from Eastern Europe. And indeed, especially the migration from Poland to the West has been massive. Yet, although today more than 1% of the Dutch population is Polish, quite surprisingly, they don't constitute a problem, neither economically, nor socially, nor culturally. But a negative sentiment in the country is persistent and actively exploited by populist parties. 
Still, I think it could be argued that the advocates of further integration in the European Union have pus pushed their luck too soon, too far. The failed effort in 2005 to introduce a constitution met resistance in just two countries with an outspoken national identity, France and the Netherlands. There was at the time no real need to enforce formally what is informally already becoming a reality year after year. The leading principles of the European Union, freedom to settle in any of the member states, freedom of trade, freedom of commerce and services, safeguarding competition, adherence to democratic principles and the European Convention on Human Rights, all these leading principles are in every practical sense of the word constitutional. They grow upon us, one might even say, and step by step they become in their own right an acquis communautaire, a common and binding way of doing things. No need to speed that up or formalize it prematurely. And the same holds for the quest for a common European identity. As yet, there is no such thing. And as one of our students in our The Idea of Europe class epitomized it succinctly, you need a common enemy to get to that. Of course, that certainly helps. And Russia is doing its best to help us in that sense. <laughs> but the politically more correct search for a common ground in history, culture, religion, language or race is doomed to fail. Even though the Union's motto is in varietate concordia, unity in diversity, there is the persistent suggestion that the European identity eventually might, in the end, might supersede or even replace national identities. And that's the bridge too far. The better solution would be to look out for moments, places or instances of identification. We all have multiple identities being a Dutchman, being a scholar, being a sociologist, being a male, being a pensioner, being here. And all these identities harbor opportunities for identification. Being Dutch and cherishing that identity does not mean that I could not identify with the idea, or for that matter, the ideals of the European Union. Holding now a passport headed by the European Union prepares me even for the gradual emergence of a European identity as an addition to the existing ones, the ones I already have, but not as its substitute. And of course, the whole idea of common cultural roots as a European is nothing but a late and rather snobbish echo of the illusion of superiority over the barbarians in all other parts of the world, including the United States. But let's face it, what today is shared culturally by the Europeans is not so much a common heritage as an, as an indebtedness to the United States and its culture. English is not the official language of the EU. There are 24 official languages. But for all practical purposes, English is the lingua franca of Europe, even in Brussels. And that's not the result of an extra effort from the side of the British. Last week, Professor Abraham de Swaan of the University of Amsterdam made that once again convincingly clear here in a lecture at Columbia University. And the superiority, you could say, the lingua franca position of English goes much further than just the language alone, and the same holds for the United States. In literature, music, movies, fashion, foods, drinks, sports, computers, soft and hardware, America sets the trend and all nations of Europe look over each other's shoulder to the West. In that sense, they share a common culture, identifying with what is an en vogue in the United States. All nations of Europe have, at least in some areas, and more specifically in connection with their own language or history, a specific cultural identity of their own. But only very occasionally this attracts and captivates an audience in other countries. Culturally and economically, we live already in a far more globalized world than emotionally, institutionally, or politically. Harry Mulisch, the author of one of the most acclaimed novels in Dutch literature, The Discovery of Heaven, once said, what the future needs most is time. And the future is the European Union, and it needs its time not to become heaven, but maybe a haven for all European nations. 
And I believe that the so-called fragility of the European project is at least partly inflicted by the proponents and advocates of a stronger European Union, wishing this would have a clear profile like the US or the Germany has as a federal state. I think we have to accept that the EU is foremost and for most of the coming years will remain an effort to come to a full-dressed economic and financial union, gradually spilling over to all areas of policy making. And in fact, this is already the case, as we see how the EU is gaining influence in the areas of health, science, education, cultural, tourism and migration. The member states, on their part, are obliged to respect the laws given by the European Union. They have preference over their own law. And it is estimated that at present, more than half or even two-thirds of the new laws on the level of the nation states are pure translations of European laws. And what on the one side may be characterized as a spillover in new areas is on the other side little less than as a member you fall into a trap. It has become practically impossible to leave the European Union. And even if the UK would decide to do so, it will probably mean that its position is going to be aching to that of Switzerland or Norway, following the rules of the European Union without participating in the political decision-making process itself. So, what looks at first sight as fragile and is even becoming more and more fragile, I think it's a mere image or even a chimera of what in reality is a very resilient function developed into a structure as soon as it is put under pressure. So, it's maybe not stable, but certainly not fragile, the European Union. Thank you for your attention. Sold out. That's pretty good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, I really would like to thank Martha and Vicky, first for their introduction, but I think more generally for the hospitality that they have extended to both of us. It's been uh, fantastic. It's been a real, real pleasure to occupy a chair named after one of my favorite queens. <laughs> and it's been a special pleasure to do so at this uh, wonderful university that I actually visit for the second time in my life. It gets better every time, let me assure you. And it's a pleasure to contribute to this debate tonight, a public debate on the fragility of Europe. Exactly a week ago, ladies and gentlemen, I went to Princeton to listen to Paul Krugman, who delivered a public lecture there. He is easily, I think, the most controversial, perhaps the most interesting economist of our time. And his topic was the lesson that could be learned from recent European predicaments. And ladies and gentlemen, his conclusion was crystal clear. Europe, he said, provided the perfect example of how not to cope with a major financial crisis. <laughs> of course, to begin with, he saw the euro as a serious mistake that should never have occurred at all. And this is, of course, when economists with a worried look in their eyes start to use phrases like optimal single currency areas, which, as you will have guessed, they emphatically think Europe is not. And then the rest of Mr. Krugman's argument can easily be summarized by a very firmly held three-word opinion, Keynes was right. That is to say, he thinks that a shortfall in demand can best be compensated for, in some form at least, by the national governments. And the politics of austerity, Mr. Krugman said, have been a disaster for Europe. And yet you could hear him think, in spite of all his columns, many Europeans, especially many European politicians, especially many ministers of finance, and especially the one from Germany, still refuse to see the error of their ways. 
It is not just, says Mr. Krugman, that Europeans don't see it. They don't even see that they don't see it. Even more embarrassing. Europe, as you heard from Paul Schnabel, is in trouble. It is perhaps not quite as fragile as some of its critics think it is, as Paul also argued, but its immediate future does represent a pretty big challenge. And you know this is just a colloquium for a in seemingly insurmountable barrier. The US, of course, has done very well in escaping from the recession. It has annual economic growth now in excess of 3%. Europe, with growth at less than half that rate, is still in the middle of that recession. What it needs from its governments is reform, and what it gets is free money for the rich for the European Central Bank. So with the lack of a decent saving interest rate, most of that money is flowing into the global stock market with another bubble already in the making. And already you'll be pleased to hear somebody has predicted that that bubble will burst on Columbus Day 2015, exactly a year from now. <laughs> so I would like you to remember that you heard it here first. <laughs> Yet, as Paul Schnabel also pointed out, and of course I agree, the rumors of Europe's death are highly exaggerated and have been so for a while. To unscramble the eggs that form Europe is pretty hard and pretty costly to begin with. Euro vultures take note. But more fundamentally, Europe has become much more of a persistent reality than many of its observers realize. The idea of Europe, which is the title of this Queen Wilhelmina seminar that Paul and I are teaching, has deeper and stronger roots than Eurosceptics care to admit. But where are these located? What is the crucial idea on which Europe ultimately rests? Ladies and gentlemen, it was very tempting for us to look first for them in one of the great Columbia freshman classes called Contemporary Civilization. It is a class that plays almost exclusive tribute to Europe as the cradle of that civilization, describing century after century of relentless especially European progress in culture and in science. It is a great story, and the university should be pleased that all our students really love it. But is it true? Well, as great as it is, it features a few disturbing discontinuities, such as when, after the Roman Empire collapsed, the torch passed on to Byzantium, and then further eastwards, rather than westwards. And frankly, the Egyptians and the Assyrians might also feel slightly insulted. So can't we do a little better than that in identifying the European legacy? Where else then can we look? Not so much at European history, because that after all is the history of Europeans fighting each other, rather than jointly fighting an external enemy. Not so much at language either, because that fragile Indo-German linguistic alliance is rather rudely disturbed by very different European languages such as Finnish and Hungarian. What else do we have? Perhaps the idea of Europe sits on the historical European commitment to the spirit of the Enlightenment. But somewhat embarrassingly, it actually took the American Revolution to inject that spirit into the Netherlands. Perhaps it sits in the European heritage of early industrialization, but then the Chinese hydro engineers of 2,000 years earlier might feel underappreciated too. Or perhaps, and let me say so far most convincingly to the students in our class, it sits in the socialization that followed upon that early industrialization, a socialization which resulted in unique European labor relations, in a unique European mix of collective and individual responsibility, and in a very different work-life balance than Goldman Sachs seems to recommend to its employees. <laughs> so, indeed, as mixed feelings as one can have about the modern welfare state, and let me assure you they exist in Europe as well as outside Europe, at least no one will truly dispute its European, its European roots, not even the Brits. 
who after all had Lord Beveridge laid the foundation in 1942. And fortunately, Mr. Krugman, in his one and only positive statement, grudgingly acknowledged that the European welfare state was not the root cause of the evil that befell the continent. One of some of the bigger welfare states actually did quite well, including the Netherlands. Still, still is the ultimate symbol of Europe not a bit more than the cue for the dole, I wonder. It is, ladies and gentlemen, not easy to get to the essence of Europe. Perhaps it has been suggested we should try to discover that core of Europe by looking and savoring at everything that it is not and claim that its strength is precisely its lack of uniformity, its lack of homogeneity, and its lack of consistency. Not a single culture, perhaps, but a bouillon de culture, as the French say, and this is the right location to use at least a few French words. Cleverly organized to preserve as much variety, as much diversity, and as much pluriformity as possible, and turn that characteristic into the European brand and the European trademark. When well-meaning American admirers like Jeremy Rifkin enthuse about Europe, this is what they seem to strike the most, this heterogeneity, this broad process of European integration, its governance driven by the notion of decentralized subsidiarity, a notion borrowed curiously enough from the Roman Catholic Church, which to me at least never appeared reluctant to impose a serious dose of central discipline. Nevertheless, the short summary of this doctrine is delegate every decision to the lowest possible level of hierarchy. And this principle sounds much easier than it is. And in fact, never before has an attempt at national integration be based on that particular principle. It is, I think, and I agree with Mr. Rifkin, a spectacular experiment. So is Europe perhaps entitled to a little patience on its progress from its transatlantic neighbor who at a comparable stage in its own development was sitting in the middle of a civil war that was fought precisely over the American limit to that same subsidiarity principle. Ladies and gentlemen, what holds Europe together when the going is good or when it is less so is as much consensus about what it is as about what it is not and would never want to be. A young confederation desperately needs friends, we know that, but it also needs opposition, it needs resistance, it needs enemies to close its rank against. It needs an opposite to define what it really stands for. That is the role that some Europeans now view for the Islam, a serious opponent, and coincidentally the only non-Western civilization represented in that great Columbia freshman course. A civilization defeated in 732 by Charles Martel in one of the few really European moments in our early history. And now back to worry us at the gates of the continent. Europe has indeed serious issues of principle to defend in its interaction with the Islam. And it is only when the Islam as a counterforce to Europe is projected onto its many helpless Islamic refugee victims that drift into the continent that this dispute turns into an ugly and despicable vehicle for populist politicians. Europe needs to look for the right battles. It needs to look for the right enemies. It is surrounded by what the economist has called a ring of fire, stretching from northern Africa through the Middle East to the Ukraine. Plenty of enemies to choose from. So far, in its efforts at specification, Europe has largely raised expectations among its supporters on which it has failed to deliver. The Arab Spring has petered out into a dismal autumn, and the Ukrainians have been given to understand by the West that they really will have to survive on their own strength. To resolve the challenges, that word again, that emanate from the ring of fire calls for the best that Western diplomacy can offer. Let's hope that it will be made available. Ladies and gentlemen, crises can close the ranks of a confederation as well as a common enemy can. And again, Europe needs to work on responses that turn these crises into opportunities. 
and it does. Europe may, for example, have failed abysmally in coping properly with the economic crisis, as Mr. Krugman claims. But at least the crisis has brought, by way of fortuitous response, a banking union that everybody said was impossible a few years ago, a new form of budgetary discipline that will ensure that the next big crisis will at least be different from the previous one, and a new determination to reduce the democratic deficit. Never before has the European Parliament exercised such influence on the composition of the new European Commission as in recent weeks. It is actually starting to look like a channel for real democratic influence. The young confederation needs enemies and it needs rivals. Enemies like ISIS and political rivals like the reborn Russia. And economic rivals like the US with its spectacular supply of training and technology, or like China, with its spectacular demand for the luxuries of life. But perhaps Europe, more than by any external rival, has been driven forward by its own internal rival, as it's often called, the ghost that haunts it from the past, rising from the bloodshed on European soil over centuries and centuries of conflict and war. Surely it's that continuing specter of war, that internal challenge of never again that inspired the great Europeans like Schumann and Monet in their first effort at peaceful integration. And there is perhaps no other accomplishment than their successful elimination of any future war in the heart of Europe, which is so simultaneously cherished and heeded by my generation and ignored and shrugged off by that of our children. Ladies and gentlemen, there is more than enough that Europe is not it is certainly not a super state by any standard. It has no army, it has no single fiscal system, it has no single healthcare system, it has no single education system, it has no ruler and it has no constitution. It does not even have a public opinion. Its only effort at a continental newspaper failed miserably. But it does have the beginnings of a serious political infrastructure, including a serious parliament, a serious flag, and a pretty serious anthem. And of course, it does control by far the largest and the most varied consumer market in the world. That is much, much more than a first step. And after six year, 60 years, maybe it is as much and can be reasonably expected. There is a lot that Europe is not, but there's also a lot that it triumphantly is. And as we meet here on Columbus Day, let us remember that today, quite appropriately, we commemorate a great European who had no clue where he was heading <laughs> and who unlocked the complete potential of America while only poorly funded by a European government. So, how fragile is Europe? I would say as fragile and as volatile as ongoing political experiments always are, but at the same time also as solid and as irreversible as the background against which these experiments have been carried out. A perspective as seductive as the one that inspired Zeus to abduct the young virgin and to secure her place in the history of the world. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for these very eloquent uh, talks full of, full of meaning, full of significance. We're going to now spend about 25 minutes commenting. Uh, so uh, Professor Berman will be first, if you okay. would mind, and then Mr. Bachman, and then I will uh, speak, and then uh, we'll get some responses, and then we'll open up to the audience so that there'll be good time to questions and answers. Um, well, it's always easier to comment on something that's sort of provocative or extreme. These struck me as extremely um, sober and considered um, comments. So I'll, I'll try to play a little bit of devil's advocate, but, um, but um, it's a little harder in this case than it might be in others. Um, so the question that was posed was about um, Europe's fragility. Um, and both of the speakers sort of seemed to agree that Europe was less fragile today than it was 10 years ago, and also that 
given the sort of expectations that one might have of a new political entity, relatively new, 60, 70 years old, that Europe is more or less where um, it might be expected to be. Um, the sort of alternative view would be to think about um, political entities as sharks, that is to say if they don't keep moving forward that they die, um, that simply being stable or not collapsing is not um, the best criteria for success and maybe even the best criteria by which to judge fragility. And so if we think of things from that perspective, right, whether we see the future for Europe as going forward or if the best that we can hope for is a lack of collapse, then, then the fragility question takes on perhaps um, a slightly different meaning. From an American perspective, I think that's the way the story is often told, right? That, that Europe may not be on the verge of collapse, falling apart the way it might have seemed a few years ago, but that the primary kind of um, quality or characteristic one sees is a, a sort of a stagnation, right? A, a lack of sense of where the next step will be, of how um, improvements can be made. And from that perspective, the fragility seems um, quite stark, um, particularly when one thinks of how Europeans themselves seem to view the European Union, right? The best you seem to get, right, is, well, we don't want it to go away, we're not necessarily interested in leaving, but it no longer seems a source for hope or a place one would turn to look for help um, solving problems. And that strikes me as, as a very serious consideration and, and one beyond the simple question of whether or not um, you know, sort of collapse is, um, is what's likely to happen in the near future. Um, also from an American perspective, um, when I look at the European Union today, I see some striking and I would say very unpleasant um, similarities with the United States, um, both from a sort of political and um, an economic perspective. Um, one of the most striking characteristics of the US today, actually this is um, a striking characteristic of our political system more generally, is its tendency for deadlock. Um, the fact that we have so many different levels, it's not just a federal state, but one also where our founding fathers wanted to devolve power to the closest to the people as possible in many ways, that oftentimes in crises, these systems really can become um, a way for nothing to happen, especially when there's no consensus at a social level. And this seems to be something very much um, of a European phenomenon as well, right, which is crises can be times when things are propelled forward, but they can also be times when fissures that are already there are really kind of um, made even deeper. And it seems to me that that's true in both the U.S. and in Europe, right, that the crisis has not propelled things forward as it did in the U.S., for instance, during um, um, and before the Second World War, but instead has kind of highlighted divisions about what the good life is, what the future should be, and what the role of the central government is. I mean, obviously the central government in the US is different than it is in Europe, but still sort of, again, a lack of kind of ability of those people at the top levels to kind of lead the way forward or to have any consistent or coherent vision of how to deal with problems seems very a very striking feature of both the United States and um, Europe today. Um, the second sort of um, worrying similarity is the problems of governing um, societies that are very divided. Um, now in the United States we have an American society, in Europe obviously you have a society made up of many different societies, but you know when I, I study the Scandinavian countries to a large degree or I think about the Dutch, and it's very striking to me to see people who are very willing to pay 50% of their incomes in taxes to help their fellow citizens, but who will want nothing to do with transferring funds to people in Southern Europe or other parts of Europe because they're irresponsible, um, they can't be trusted with the money, um, their cultures and their institutions are incapable of dealing, responsi dealing responsibly with funds like this. I mean, this is a problem we have in the US, right? One of the reasons why we have a smaller state and in particular a smaller welfare state is because our citizens don't feel the kind of social cohesion or social solidarity that's existed historically, at least in the post-war period in many European societies. And I think this is something that we've seen highlighted in this crisis as well, that it's very difficult um, to get people to come together to try to help others when there's not a strong sense of social identity or or national identity. It makes governing in crises, and in particular, um, transferring funds, 
among different um, citizens much more difficult. And I think this is something that um, we see the consequences of in the United States and is becoming um, clearer as a problem in, um, in Europe. Um, so if we're looking for the future, right, if the question of fragility is not simply measured on a negative basis, i.e. Europe is not fragile because it's not going to collapse, but if we think about fragility from the perspective of can we think of a Europe moving forward that is robust, that is hopeful, that is something more than it is today, then I think the question um, is much more open. Um, and I think for that to really happen, for Europe to be something that is once again not simply a kind of status quo thing, but a way for Europe to propel itself sort of into the forefront of world developments, so you'd have to see a European Union that was um, capable, I think, of addressing, if not solving, the two major problems facing Europe today. One is economic. Will the European Union be part of the solution to the current economic crisis, or will it continue to just be a drag or do nothing? Um, otherwise, it seems difficult to see how people will ever look to it to solve other kinds of problems if it can't provide some solutions to the current economic one. And then again, there's the more um, abstract, but perhaps more difficult and certainly related political issue, right? If Europe is simply rules and regulations, laws that are kind of imposed on Europeans in various countries, if that's all it is, then again, it's hard to imagine why people would feel any kind of um, sense of hopefulness or attachment to it, right? If it's not gonna become something more than that, just simply bureaucrats and institutions handing down laws and regulations, then again, you would expect not to see much in the way of kind of um, forward momentum. Um, I agree, of course, that you know, 60 years, 70 years is not a very long time. And certainly if we look back at our own American history, um, you know, the United States did not look very united or very healthy in many ways 60 or 70 years after the American Revolution. Nonetheless, if you know, you're sort of trying to think about the future, it seems that this really is a pivotal point. And the question is whether mm -hmm. Europe will emerge from the crisis with a forward momentum or simply with a sort of sigh of relief that the whole thing um, hasn't come falling down. Um, so. Thank you. If I may, uh, first in the first place uh, express my gratitude uh, to the hosts uh, to allow me to be back here with great pleasure. And uh, I will not uh, have the necessity to oppose the two gentlemen who gave such uh, brilliant lectures, not only because we know each other, but uh, I think they are absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, I will start with an American voice. Um, Perry Anderson uh, is a well-known uh, historian of um, state formation in Europe, and he published five years ago uh, an interesting book uh, called The New Old World, which is, in fact, uh, the post-war European integration, uh, which he deals with. And uh, that book ends, a very uh, heavy book, with 50 pages on the future, his uh, uh, vision on the future, which he wrote, by the way, uh, just before the financial crisis uh, uh, appeared, by the way, which uh, did not uh, find its roots in Europe, I think. Um, I quote Perry Anderson, uh, neither the internal nor external direction of the community is yet quite settled. Without clarity of means or ends, the union seems to uh, many adrift. Without clarity, and it is adrift. Yet it is its apparent lack of any further coherent finality deplored on all sides might on one kind of reckoning be counted as a saving grace, permitting the unintended consequences that have tracked integration from the start to yield further, uh, possibly better surprises. So, that vision, five years ago, is still seems uh, very applicable today. Uh, although uh, we are not sure yet if the uh, events, which he could not foresee in uh, 2008 when he uh, wrote that uh, analysis, um, 
uh, if that uh, made it uh, a better uh, future. As a historian, I will address a few aspects which have been mentioned uh, by the two speakers and um, uh, give also comments which are related to the present situation. I have four points. The first uh, deals with the Euroscepticism, which has been uh, discussed already. It is a reality. It appeared in the last uh, elections held in May for the European Parliament in two major countries, uh, in France and in the UK, the party who won the largest amount of votes was Eurosceptic, nationalistic, populistic, the UKIP and uh, the party uh, Front National in France. Uh, and uh, the concern uh, which I see in this evolution is that government parties, both uh, in England and in France, conservative in the one case and so-called social democrat on the other, uh, in the same way, go in the same direction in trying to avoid further votes to drift towards the populistic side by doing the same, by uh, applying a similar, very similar rhetoric. A rhetoric, by the way, which is not so different from the rhetoric you, you can hear in this country uh, from the side of the Tea Party which is uh, a very negativistic uh, uh, analysis. In fact, it's no analysis at all. It's a series of negative uh, statements without much uh, depth. But if we look at what governments are doing, and I'm talking about what happened in the last weeks, the new French uh, government um, uh, is, uh, had uh, a few laws uh, passed by the parliament, uh, which in fact are uh, going directly against the uh, convention, the stability pact, which is the basis of the euro. Uh, by exceeding the norm of 3%, which has been agreed by all countries uh, participating in the euro, uh, by exceeding uh, it by 1%. And the, the French parliament accepted uh, a, a debt rate in the f uh, coming years of 5%. <coughs> And the Prime Minister Val uh, stated in his defense of that, uh, breaking the rules, la France décide seule. <laughs> France uh, decides uh, on its own. Well, this type of rhetoric is extremely dangerous because on the one hand it tries to walk in the direction of nationalistic reactions uh, against the rules which have been set by the governments of the EU member states themselves. So they play, these, this prime minister plays a double role. In Brussels, he agrees. In Paris, he says, it's Brussels, as being a bureaucratic and foreign uh, institution. No, the decisive instance in the EU is, in fact, the Council of Ministers. Uh, at all levels, uh, in all uh, disciplines, it are the ministers who are the legislative, legislative body par excellence. In some fields there is uh, co-legislative uh, competence with the parliament, but that's extremely limited still. So there is a double-faced role of the uh, ministers who, not being elected representatives on the European level, nevertheless are the legislators in Europe. And they play that double game, uh, doing other things at home and telling other things at home as they are doing in um, uh, their meetings uh, in Brussels. Uh, his colleague uh, David Cameron uh, last week uh, declared in the, um, in the yearly congress of his party Fearing the fact that the, uh, the UKIP, uh, the Eurosceptic uh, party in his country, uh, which, by the way, uh, took one seat in Parliament uh, last week uh, from his own uh, Conservative Party, um, from that fear, he adopted one of the arguments, anti-immigration arguments, uh, uh, used by the populistic side, by declaring that uh, 
Britain should consider a selective withdrawal from the European Convention on the Human Rights on that specific point. What is he doing? Uh, you say it, uh, the, the European Declaration on Human Rights is part of a kind of Euro European constitution. By the way, it's not an EU uh, convention. It is a much larger institution, an agreement and convention, which includes many more countries, even Russia. Uh, is uh, uh, supportive uh, and member of that convention. Can we consider a kind of constitution to be available à la carte? We don't like this particular item, so we withdraw from that convention. Is that an attitude we can uh, accept from a government of a major member state? I think there is a real problem there. Um, and. Um, that, these governments are uh, ex expressing, expressing and supporting uh, Eurosceptic uh, movements in trying to recuperate the votes they are losing to right-wing parties. My second point will be after this observation that um, yeah, uh, we have to look for uh, explanations. Uh, uh, Paul Schnabel already referred to um, to inquiries, to data uh, which are available about uh, the attitudes and the opinions uh, among the European uh, uh, population. Um, by the way, it makes a huge difference which question is being asked. Uh, and of course, as a sociologist, uh, Paul can explain that much better than I do. But there is one question, and there was traditionally in the Eurobarometer uh, inquiries, a question, uh, do you consider Europe to be a good thing, the Union, uh, to be a good thing. And indeed, that question was uh, answered uh, year after year uh, in a positive sense by a uh, decreasing number of uh, people, ending at 27% uh, in 2011. After 2011, that question was no longer asked in the European <laughs> Barometer <laughs> Inquiry. But we know that uh, it makes a huge difference, and uh, this is uh, empirically based on an uh, analysis made uh, among the voters for the populistic uh, party in the Netherlands. Um, when the, the, the question is asked in the most general terms, uh, are you for or against the European Union and the stronger uh, European Union, more competences, the answer is no, in majority, for the, among the voters of, for that party. But if precise questions are asked, what do you think to be the right level uh, for decision making in the field of energy provision, then the same people for 70% will say, yes, that should be done on the European level. And uh, the question asked uh, about uh, on what level should uh, foreign policy being uh, coordinated, 58% of the right-wing voters in the Netherlands say that is a European matter. So it de really depends uh, if we steer only on these very diffuse, very general, very unprecise and uninformed uh, questions uh, and responses, or if we ask further and if we inform the public better. Perhaps uh, we should advise uh, the European governments not only to, to speak with one voice in the direction of Brussels and to their own uh, constituencies, but also to communicate better to their uh, parliaments in the first place and to their uh, uh, voters in the second place. Uh, it has been said that uh, a large uh, percentage, uh, interpretations uh, are different, but a large percentage of the national uh, legislation is in fact prepared on the European level nowadays, but what we can see is that European national parliaments hardly discuss these proposals. So if there is a democratic deficit, it's also there that we have to look. Are national parliaments really interested in discussing the agreements made by their governments in Brussels? And that is uh, a black hole which needs uh, to be explained better. Um, explanations for these negative feelings. Um, 
um, it has been mentioned uh, by Paul Schnabel in the in the 1950s when the integration process started. Uh, it was clearly uh, a project of uh, the political and economic elites, uh, but the whole atmosphere was a very different one from nowadays, and we see the shift in the attitude which uh, especially occurred in the 1980s. Uh, there's an increasing um, uh, negative attitude, especially since then. But are we so sure that Brussels is really uh, the origin of that uh, uh, uncertainty about the future? Or is it the observation that the whole world has changed uh, very uh, profoundly? Uh, isn't it uh, the, the globalization in the sense that the, the weight in population numbers of Europe in the whole world has decreased dramatically uh, since the 1950s when uh, Europe, uh, the European population was still one quarter of the world population while today it is just 7%. Uh, isn't it the, the rapid increase of the Asian economies which uh, creates feelings of uncertainty rather than the integration process in Europe itself. So the, the analysis for the uncertainties which really exist uh, needs further uh, explanation and further research, but the answers given by populistic uh, uh, parties need to be addressed more carefully than by going in the same direction as we see governments doing really nowadays. It is true that uh, the institutional structure of the EU um, has all kinds of uh, weaknesses. They have been addressed by uh, our speakers. Um, there's a democratic deficit. Uh, you were very positive, Alexander, about uh, last week's uh, events. Uh, indeed, the hearings of the commissioners uh, uh, were uh, tough experiences during the two weeks. Uh, the Parliament still has to decide uh, on the, the 22nd of October, but after two weeks of discussion, only one uh, of the proposed commissioners uh, has withdrawn on uh, so-called her <coughs> own initiative, under pressure, let's say, um, and that was a very weak proposal. Let's be clear, who uh, designates the commissioners that are the national governments. Again, there is the initial factor to be addressed. And who elected them? Nobody. They are not elected. Um, and what we saw happening is that uh, only four uh, proposed commissioners were really uh, under serious criticism for very good reasons. Uh, the Spanish one for um, conflict of interest, being uh, heavily implied personally and uh, by his family links in the oil business, should he then have uh, energy uh, provision in his uh, portfolio. Um, there are other examples. Uh, Moscovici, uh, the, the French uh, candidate, was a candidate when he was a minister until a few months ago, uh, who uh, was really the author of the French deficit in breaking the rules uh, of the Euro Stability Pact. And now he should be the guardian of that uh, task. So there were doubts. Um, and then there was the, the candidate of the Hungarian government. Uh, be aware of the fact that it is a government which has broken all the European treaties in the past years. Has broken the, um, the, 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 the basic rules of uh, the liberal state in, in Western, in the Western world, has limited the freedom of the press, uh, the independence of the judges, the freedom of religion. Um, the, the Prime Minister Orban uh, f openly declares uh, uh, to be an advocate of the illiberal state, taking as examples uh, the leaders of Russia, China and Turkey. He is a member of uh, the European Popular Party, uh, so-called uh, Christian parties. And there is a, an agreement, obviously, between the two largest parties in the parliament uh, that they will not attack each other's 
candidates. So the implication is that the former minister of justice of Hungary, who was responsible for all these breaking uh, uh, aspects of the, uh, the European constitution or even uh, um, Hungarian constitution, um, that he will be a commissioner. Uh, he will not be uh, outvoted uh, simply by the agreement made by the two parties in the majority. So there are still very strong weaknesses, uh, notwithstanding the fact that these people have been heard, but when it came to the voting, even the social democrats have forgotten all their principles in defense of the, um, uh, the uh, democratic uh, uh, states. So there, there, are, there remain uh, concerns, which are institutional concerns, the lack of transparency, the lack of democratic uh, legitimacy uh, need to be addressed in the uh, near future and I think uh, that um, uh, is a, an urgent matter. I come uh, to my uh, closing <laughs> remarks because I am taking too much time I think. Um, what is needed is uh, more responsibility, more transparency. Uh, we have to take into account that uh, communication is a little bit more complicated when uh, uh, 24 languages are involved. That explains in part the difficulty to create one newspaper, uh, but um, none of the European leaders had the talent, the rhetoric talent of uh, your president. And if we had such an advocate of the European uh, 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 integration process, that would help but it still remains difficult to do that in 24 languages. So that is an objective fact, which is the effect of uh, European history, which is a history which uh, is an integration process, but at the difference from what happened in empires such as the Chinese empire or the Russian empire or even the United States, the unity which you see there has been based on conquest military sup superiority, expulsion of other populations, and even today, suppression of other populations. While, on the other hand, the experiment we see going on in Europe is unique in <coughs> world history, namely the creation of uh, a polity of some kind without a precedent, but based on the free participation of its constituent parts, which are realities in history, which are embedded in history, namely uh, religious communities, uh, national communities, and state structures. It, is, uh, it would be foolish to try to negate the reality of these uh, bounds. People feel that they uh, belong to a nation, to a religious community, and to a state, because even the states uh, have uh, supported uh, by the social welfare state uh, uh, and uh, their citizens in a way which uh, uh, our American friends might uh, still envy uh, us. So there is that reality of uh, belonging, feelings of belonging. We have to take that into account and understand that uh, people need uh, some time, as it has been said, uh, to adapt to a growing reality. And in that respect, it, uh, it requires more loyalty uh, from our leaders than we have seen in the past. We're getting here quite a range of, of responses, so I think that there will certainly be res responses from you. I, I think I would like to continue with, with uh, a, a kind of uh, response uh, w which takes into account that we're dealing with <coughs> two levels. One is a critique uh, of, or a reflection on the fragility of the European Union, whether that's going to disintegrate or not, and I think we could probably all agree with you that it's not going to disintegrate, uh, at least not in the way we imagine in the uh, immediate see of the crisis that is that the Euro zone would collapse in some way. But at the same time, there, I, I think of a growing gap between the European 
Union and the ideal of Europe, uh, which was once regarded as being completely embedded in the European Union, and that you know, leads to forms of crisis, uh, which were understood, if you want, economically during the recession, uh, the Great Recession, and which not just continue, but I, th I think by a more a dialectical process, given the way that the crisis uh, was caused by the liberalization which created the Euro, and with the same elites which caused the crisis, uh, that that uh, is going to you know, unfold in uh, ways that uh, are, are very um, difficult imagining a, you know, a good outcome, so that we may be seeing newer kinds of crises that may be moved from the political realm to the social realm, uh, and then you know, back uh, to create a, a, a much more serious uh, po uh, political crisis. So I, I guess there's one you know, question that, that, that I have is how an elite or, or sets of elites which have involved in the European Union take responsibility uh, in a deep way for the extraordinary the misbegotten nature of the Euro. So, so not that the Euro was established, which is, uh, you know, Krugman uh, we might criticize, but the fact that it was framed in this neoliberal way without the appropriate institutions, uh, which meant that, uh, you know, world markets being the way they are, uh, that uh, the, the recession would, may have started elsewhere in global imbalances, but particularly then uh, hit the European uh, uh, Union. It, the question is not just then the causes, but why there hasn't been a fuller solution, or at least a solution which is adequate, not simply to the question of you know, uh, credit uh, with economic recovery, but some of the outcomes, for example, youth unemployment, that seems is, is just stunningly striking that right now in the European Union overall it's 22%. Yes, it's low in the Netherlands at 10.8%, and in Germany at 7.8%, in Greece 57 Spain and Italy it's around 43%. Uh, and you know, the question of how the, the, you know, the kinds of responses from the European Union, which you could say, yes, the European Union doesn't have that budget, but this is a, que a big, very, very big question thinking forward. Well, what possible relationship could this youth uh, generation have? I mean, this is unemployment figures under of people under 25 in so-called needs, you know, not in, uh, in education, not uh, employed, and not in training. What kind of connection could they have with the European uh, Union? In other words, with the structure of governance uh, going, going forward. I think that there's a, another dimension, thinking again about the elites, uh, that, that is, th this is an ever more globalized world, certainly we see in the United States that the economic and financial elite have become more and more detached from the countries that produce them. And this has led, you know, leading certainly in the U.S. to higher and higher levels of inequality, but also again on the part of the elites to saying, we can't control that, even though the question of their legitimacy certainly uh, is, is at, at stake. And then moving beyond that, it seems to me it was a big question if you want constitutional disorder, which you know is hard to diagnose uh, uh, precisely, but from, you know, this is a perspective from outside of Europe, from a historian whose work has largely been on the interwar period and the post-war uh, period, uh, that to see that you know Germany now occupies a position of economic as well as now political preponderance, which uh, has often created huge disabilities in Europe, to put it uh, in, a, in, in a simple way, uh, and that is, that that in some sense becomes a constitutional disorder that how that imbalance, which has been accumulated, is now going to be represented in European. Uh, institutions, uh, it's, uh, because the politics becomes more un unaccountable, not simply because the, 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 so many decisions are made by the European Commission, by the European C uh, Central Bank, and by the um, IMF, but also because of the, the, the sense of the disparity of power between creditor nations 
and debtor nations, which has now been built in to the European uh, Union. I, I think that these questions are especially important because the ideal of Europe that rested on, yes, the legacy of peace, and you know, we're not seeing you know, that particular legacy, uh, I, I think, contested, though the question, I'll come back to the question of your Ukraine, but I don't think that most young people necessarily recognize that legacy. I think that's a, our generation, your generation, Von Rumpi's generation. He remembers his father, you know, almost being carried away to the camps and then being saved. But I don't think that that is any more an immediate question for the young people that Europe is you know, about peace, and that's the reason to protect the European uh, Union. It could certainly connected to the rule of law. Okay. But there, there is a con there's constitutional disorder to the degree that, there, that, that uh, it's so difficult uh, for the European Commission uh, and, and, and these other bodies to be accountable. The question of, e of equality. Well, yes, we keep speaking about the welfare state, but in fact, there's been a very strong attack on the welfare state, and it's not been e adequate to deal with youth unemployment, it's not been adequate to deal with growing inequality, even though that on the continent may be less uh, than in the United States or uh, in, in, in Great Britain. And uh, coming out of this, there has been in many ways an undermining of Europe's normative power, which has been so important in the security questions. Uh, it, uh, recently, there's been so much discussion of the, the Ukraine uh, listening to, reading uh, the work of one of the architects of the European neighborhood policies, Sir Michael Lay, who was part of the European uh, Commission. I mean, he uh, was despaired of it. He said that very much the Ukraine crisis had uh, faults within Europe itself and the European Union. That is a kind of triumphalism and arrogance about holding out Europe's normative power. Uh, and say and as an inducement, not paying attention to the fact that Ukraine historically was divided, not paying attention uh, uh, enough uh, 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 to uh, Russia, not just to Putin's arrogance, but also to the very complicated relations around petroleum, not paying attention to the oligarchs of, who give so much structure to Putin, uh, who have owned chunks of Western Europe, and not paying attention to uh, uh, Putin as the leader of the BRICS. Okay? So having actually quite considerable power uh, outside of the European area. Uh, so, and then he added, this was compounded by the fact that so Russia was so rancorous about the expansion of NATO, and then in the end by a lack of a foreign policy, substituting instead for a, a, a significant foreign policy, the fact of this normative power which then, uh, to come back to the, the, the introduction of our remarks, has been in some ways very much undercut now by the fact that Europe no longer providing that leadership uh, in the realm of the welfare state, in the realm of the solidarity, in the realm of a, an area uh, which could accommodate both very significant immigration, which is asked in many ways better than the United States. Uh, and uh, in the end, not being able to see now, we have a hard time seeing now, how uh, one could pass reforms, uh, in the old sense of reforms, social democratic, or Keynesian, or you know, new constitutional uh, devices, uh, which uh, and, you know, could begin create a very strong corrective, uh, and not just allow, place hope then in this kind of progressive unfolding, uh, as if we are still in that post-war moment where progression, 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 and progress and these ideals are still intact. Now, we leave it to you to reply, and I'll give you 30 seconds each, no, I'll give you five, five minutes, and then we're gonna open this up. Oh, I was the first, yeah, so. Um, yeah, if, if, if I hear your comments, and uh, maybe, yeah, I will use it. If I hear the comments, uh, you could say, well, of course, there's nothing, even, there's nothing fragile about the whole thing, but the thing is falling to pieces. Um, but I think that's maybe, uh, yeah, that's, if, if you look at the situation at hand, and if you see how fast these things change, because Ukraine, a year ago, it was not a topic. Mm -hmm. Now, 
we even don't know how long mm. it will be a topic and what kind of topic it will be. Mm. All these changes are going so fast. It's the same happened, of course, with the, with the whole financial crisis. Mm. From one, the one day there was nothing there, and the other day it was a world crisis. Started somewhere in the Midwest of the United States, but having big influence also on Europe and also on the position of the Euro. That's quite right, what you, what you said. Um, what I tried to do in my, my, my little talk was um, ask for, let's say, f let's say for, you could say understanding for the fact that it is a process which started only 50 or 60 years ago and for many countries is still very, very new. And that means that it's also new for the, at least for the, the, the population of the countries that are already for 50 or 60 years in it. I mean, they, uh, they are asked to accept that suddenly Europe is becoming bigger and that there are new nations coming in they, they never knew that they would that they could exist or that they existed before 10 or 20 years so and that, that they are all seen as part of the same history of the same um, you could say of the same moral ground uh, which is very difficult for people to accept that and I think that if you push that too hard too far that people are going to oh oh have we be quiet not so fast not so much on the other hand if I think what happened after the Second World War? Uh, it seemed, if you look at compared to the First World War, what happened after that, you could say at least some of the mistakes of the, in those days have not been made again. Mm -hmm. And not trying to keep Germany small and weak, but trying to make it more prosperous, to make it more economically powerful, and to do that in, uh, in, in, in a European context, which worked. As soon as the Iron Curtain fell and uh, you could say the, the Soviet Empire, its own big Soviet Union, but also the empire around uh, which it controls, um, all these countries tried to become a member of the European Union as soon as possible, which is in itself a very interesting thing I found. And even today you see still after the, um, the, 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 the Eurozone in problems, but still more countries trying to get participating, to get a participation in the Eurozone than to get out. Of course, you could say there are profits involved. There are, uh, so for some countries, uh, it means that they will have better access to all kinds of resources. But still, I think there is something of a certain kind of optimism, hope, uh, looking at the future, which makes it more, uh, which makes it for the countries interesting to be part of that whole system. And the two countries that, uh, highly developed countries that are not part of the system, Switzerland and Norway are in fact economically completely part of the system and abide to all the rules without participating politically. Personally, I, I think that all these the, the backlashes you all describe and so on, I see them, of course, and I um, and I, I worry about them uh, a lot. I think, well, okay, how does it, how must it be, and why didn't we think about that a country like Hungary? could do things that would say, well, if you do that, you have to get out. But there is no way to do this. Eh? That, that, that's, that's a positive thing, and sometimes it's a negative thing. What France is doing is doing again what Germany and France did 10, 12 years ago, saying, well, we accept a higher uh, percentage of, of national debt uh, for this year, uh, of a um, shortage on the budget, than is accepted. On the other hand, Paul Krugman uh, would say, but maybe it's France is doing just the right thing. Um, that, that's the case. They should spend more money. And the other party would then say again, yeah, but they will spend it in the wrong way. And it will go uh, to the wrong, uh, in the wrong canals. And it will not bring that what Keynes thought that it should be, uh, that it's counter, um, it's counter to the situation so that it will help to st stimulate production and stimulate consumption and stimulate the economy. I find that very, very difficult, I must say, and I do not have a solution or something like that, but um, for today, um, I, I, I saw as my, my task was uh, to, to, to show the other part of the, uh, let's say, the more rosy part of the picture, which is quite against my character, but uh, <laughs> I do my best, um, and to say, well, let's look at it from uh, more on, an, on, an, uh, let's say on the, the, as a process which has its, uh, which has its it, it ups and downs, which is a very difficult process, becoming difficult, more difficult, the more uh, uh, nations are involved. And we had the discussion with students, only if you look at the size of the nation, size of the population, the difference in, in economic uh, position, in, in prosperity, in income per, per capita, it's huge. I mean, it's <coughs> huge between the states in the United States, but it's even more so in, in, in the European Union. 
And still, I think, well, step by step, you see the process is going on. Um, not, not, not taking into account of that, not forgetting that there are all kinds of set, uh, setbacks. Yeah, sometimes it's what we sometimes call the Axonark procession. Hey, you make three steps forward and then two steps backwards, and then three steps forward and two steps backwards, or even reverse. It's three steps backwards, or what is it? No, no, no. no, no. Eh? Just to progress. Yeah, in the <laughs> end, you go, you go forward. Slow. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and maybe also a lot of uh, yeah disappointments that you have to take in and to see if you can change it as soon as in Europe there is a certain kind of outcry that Hungary is doing the wrong things that's more than in the past was possible and it could have uh, it could have its consequences I guess I hope it will have that and also seeing what France is doing now it's not let's say it's not just accepted maybe you can't do it much about it but it makes the position of France not stronger in Europe, and certainly not the normative position of France. And you could say, well, French don't care about that, but I don't think that's the case. Just one word about uh, elite. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Um, the same holds for the welfare state. Um, even there, you could say, the whole idea of the welfare state was uh, designed by an elite, a social and a political elite, and an economically elite, without really that people would know what it would entail and what it would bring to them. But it was accepted in the 50s and the 60s, just as the European Union, as a fact of on itself, was accepted in the 50s and the 60s. And today, that's, yeah, that's one of the changes in the political arena. It happened in the United States with, uh, uh, with, with movements like the Tea Party. You see it everywhere, and that it's, uh, it's a certain kind, looks like a an, 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 um, backlash, but maybe you could say, it's the, yeah, the, also the, the sort of emancipation of the general population. Say, well, but we want to be more involved. We want to more to maybe not to know more, but to see more what it brings to us and uh, why we should support this. And that's sometimes difficult to explain. So I try to keep up with the idea. In the end, it will help us and it will bring us forward. Maybe that's a part of your of the course what is it contemporary civilization <laughs> that you are optimistic about what uh, europe can uh, can bring but uh, that's what i try to keep up uh, for today i'm very interested in what the audience thinks so i would like to be brief but let me just underline uh, and maybe elaborate a little bit on some of the points that paul has made and let me emphatically share his assessment that i want to be an optimist and maybe the only one by now but I'm happy to play that role. Um, and I'm optimistic for two reasons, two basic reasons. Fragility means, to some extent, breakability. And the one-line summary is that Europe will not break up. It just won't happen. Why? Because it's too hard. Even if you want to break it up, you could not possibly do it and you could never afford it. When you collaborate, as countries do in Europe, what you discover again and again is that when you start at a rather basic level of collaboration, collaboration calls for one thing only, more collaboration. To just facilitate whatever you realize you want to collaborate on, you need to collaborate more and more and more and more. There's only one direction. Spillovers are very much part of the European integration process. It works only in one direction. And even that artifact, if you wish, that was so criticized, and for good reasons, I think the euro um, is simply unbreakable, not because it cannot be done. I suppose it could be done in theory, but when the euro looked so poor as it did, elaborate analysis were carried out of what it would take to break it up. It simply is far too expensive. There is no way in which it can ever happen. It would just call, and simply in terms of economic growth, it would cost between 5 and 10 percent of national GDPs all over Europe. It simply won't happen. I'm not saying it was very well designed in retrospect. I'm not denying that design errors were made. I'm not denying that implementation errors were made. We will have to live with them, and we will have to do as well as we possibly can. So on one hand, whether we like it or not, almost Europe is there to stay, and the euro is there to stay, period. Now, for the good news. Um, in terms of what Europe has accomplished, it has so much, not so much accomplished a given structure that functions beautifully, but it has certainly accomplished, and especially in recent years, an increasing willingness to submit to external discipline. And that, I think, is extremely crucial. External discipline, 
for instance, in budgetary matters, whether countries like it or not, in fact, whether France likes it or not, let me say this in this French mention, it will have to submit its proposals for approval to a European forum. And if there is no approval, France is in trouble and will be fined enormous amounts of money. That just will not happen. France will have to accommodate the views and the sentiments of its neighbors to which it has itself subscribed. It has signed on the bottom line. It will be reminded of that signature again and again and again. So discipline in those terms. Discipline in banking terms. The banking union five years ago was called an impossibility. It will be a reality within two or three months. All European banks will first of all have their balance sheets cleared up and will be come under the supervision of one big, very professional, very strongly managed organization. I'm personally involved with the Dutch Central Bank, seeing it transfer its responsibilities to this new European institution. To me, it is an amazing accomplishment to get this up and running in just a few months is pretty incredible. So discipline also in that sense, but also in moral discipline. Hungary, of course, is a terrible country right now. I hope there are no Hungarians here who are really insulted, but I hope they will agree. I mean, terrible things have happened there, but the very fact that Hungary has to submit its ideas, its notions to another European forum that can essentially impose a lot of, if not practical discipline, moral discipline of what that country can and cannot do, I, think I would again regard as significant progress. Yes, of course, the European Commission is not elected. And by the way, neither are the members of the Dutch cabinet. But for the very first time in history, the chairman, the president of the European Commission, was the one picked by the European Parliament against the opposition of all the nations who really did not like that candidate very much. But there he sits with a mandate that no president of no European Commission ever had before. So yes, it's not difficult to find worrying evidence. It's not difficult to find evidence of decline, if you will, certainly decline in support. Many European citizens feel very poorly supported, very poorly served by their national governments for good reasons, because governments have committed atrocious policy errors over the past. And to that extent, I think uh, Paul Krugman is perfectly right. But going forward, I think the cause for reform has never been more clearly articulated. All European governments acknowledge the need for substantial reform. And now again, they have committed themselves to basically reminding themselves of that commitment again and again and again until it happens. Thank you very much.
Yeah, and, and, and what, what about the fact that there is youth unemployment that is of astronomical proportions? Uh, what about the fact that, yes, we created the welfare state, but it was already 20 years ago, or 20 years ago, in, in an editorial article for the Wall Street Journal that said that about around this time the whole thing would come apart because the money would run out. And there were going to be too many people who were retired and who would end up in health care, etc. And it was wonderful to go through this whole dream for a long, long time. But you know, demographics you can lie about, and they are also easy to see. You see it coming down the pipe, and you could see it coming down the pipe 20 years ago, and now it's here, and money is there, and we are all starting to worry about how we keep the system going. At the same time, in the past, we always thought that it was technology that was going to build us out, and that happened in a lot of cases. The problem now is that technology basically is enabling a society where people who are entrepreneurial, highly skilled, can abstract think, you know, can, can, can really you know, connect with each other, communicate well. For those people, this is a spectacular world. There never have been opportunities like this before. I mean, you know, if you're really good, it is not hard to make a couple hundred million dollars out for a few. Oh, really? for a few. <laughs> That, but, but the point is that that is oh, yeah, going on. Cool. That is what is going on right now. And as a result of that, there are all these people in the middle who basically are losing out because they're trying to get there. And there's probably not more than 20, 25% of the population who would actually operate in that type of work. So somehow we have to start dealing with the consequences of what is coming at us. And I think that actually whether Europe goes anywhere or for the matter the US goes anywhere or not is whether the governments in some way you know, can carve out a role while at the same time nobody wants the government involved if it gets you know, against them a little bit. You know, somehow it has to carve out a position by which it actually can start addressing these issues. We're going to continue. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Schnabel, you, uh, you mentioned the overspill and that Europe will come automatically to its, uh, uh, to, to its people. Uh, but do you also think that is the right way to do it? Wouldn't it be better, like the British will have a referendum in a couple of years, to give the <coughs> European people uh, a vision of Europe? Uh, maybe with the idea of everything that can be done locally has to be done locally. But this is our vision. This, this is how we will make our lives better in a more united Europe. Wouldn't that be better than overspill that, that, that really looks like the ploy of, of the elites, even of the Amsterdam Ring of Canal elites? I also deeply concerned about uh, the elite because the economic growth uh, is proportionally grows to, uh, to the top uh, in a very small percentage. And uh, you, you can dismiss populist uh, political parties, but the, what they tap into is a, is a deeper discontent, which is really serious. Uh, we can talk about statistics in, in Spain of uh, youth unemployment, and the reason for that happening is that an elite had to be bailed out. And it's fine by me if Europe solely is going to be defined as an economic project, but unless those disparities get addressed at the same time, it's a dead duck in the water. And that, for me, is really quite fragile. Yeah, I don't have a difficult question. Um, and I'm not as far as that I'm coming out. But I'm slightly embarrassed and hopeful. I'm embarrassed that Dutch sounds like a throat disease, but I cannot change that when I'm speaking better English. Um, but I'm embarrassed I have to go to university again to open myself to a very well-balanced uh, expose about Europe, which I didn't have while living in Europe. So I learned two things. One, I have to return more to Columbia University to learn it. And secondly, I have to, it's a call to action for me on how to become a better and effective European out of America. Thank you very much for your conversation. <laughs> I wonder actually, so um, I'm from Holland and I live now in New York and I worked uh, and lived uh, across different continents. I worked for the Central Bank but also for McKinsey, which is a very American company. Uh, comparing different culture, uh, especially amongst like the younger generations, 
one of the differences I've seen, um, and one of the things that I think could really spark the European society, is basically um, kind of like a sense of an eagerness to go for the extra mile, and also um, an eagerness to be open to the idea of the other, not from a fear-based perspective, but from a strength-based, an opportunity-based perspective. Uh, and hearing the stories about like what is there a common ide identity within Europe and what is that identity, uh, I think we can push that further to find something that we share. Uh, it's either can learn from each other within Europe um, or something that we truly share and think better about that. I think it's, it's too easy to, to say uh, we have all these different countries in Europe. Um, it's difficult to create a shared identity. So that's one. And two, I, I definitely think we need a more positive story um, rather than having unity in reacting to crisis. Uh, I would love to see um, an economy, actually, that's driven by seeing opportunities. And that's one of the things that I learned here in the US, basically uh, embracing differences to create something new, not just from the policymaker perspective, but even from the business perspective. Um, and I wonder if, um, if you share that thought and how you think we can uh, get to that get to the point. Uh, yes. uh, just in terms of France, uh, now saying they're going to violate the stability pact, and Renzi has come out saying that he supports that. Do you think there's a risk of European nations increasing the fragility of the European Union by openly flaunting the rules and supporting others who are doing it? Yes. Question or ask for a comment from Professor Block, my time and historian from Portugal. And uh, uh, from what has been discussed here, it's clear that Europe has a lot of history. Part of the problems have to deal with the fact that it's uh, the load of history, the load of the past. And, and uh, we all know that historians throughout the 19th century and uh, the great extent throughout the 20th century have fooled um, a more rigid and intolerant notion of national identity. And now that we are building this new political entity, Professor uh, Blockman, uh, what do you think historians should uh, do or what or if, if you, you can? Put it that way. What would be the, the best historical scholarship for dealing with this new reality where uh, coexisting uh, with uh, this big project of European integration, there are still uh, a lot of uh, discourses on historical past that are more particularist and not have much to do with uh, the whole concept of it. So, it's a question basically from an historian to. to Well, and I, I think I'll start with our with. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as I take up one one of these issues, that's yeah, to give Europeans a vision of Europe, and I think that's one of the of the problem most problematic things there are at the moment. If you look at what is at stake at the moment, in also on the national level. If I, uh, I was asked in the Netherlands to make an analysis of that, I said, well, yeah, the problem is that if you look at what is at stake at the moment, there are two things. That is sustainability as a thing for the future and Europe as a thing for the future. People know that it's unavoidable, that's necessary to do, to go this, these, both, both these ways, but their heart is not in it. Uh, that's one of the problems because people vote with their hearts in the, and see, certainly what they, what they um, what they voice uh, in, in papers and in, in, in meetings and rallies, etc., and, and also on the internet, it has to do with what they feel as, as the momentum, the, you could say it's the emotion and so on. And the rational thing, uh, thinking about the sustainability of the world and of the, the, uh, the, 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 the fact that the, 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 the generations after us still should have a good life and the future of living in Europe, living with a smaller welfare state than in the past was the case, one of the issues raised this, uh, this evening. Certainly the case, but it does not mean that the welfare state is over. I think or the real, or we, just like the United States, don't call itself a welfare state, but in many ways it is some kind of a welfare state to many. And, it's, uh, and you only can discuss if they, they, they or you organize it in a way that it's sustainable, that you can pay for it and that people really have a profit of it, which makes the, the life more worthwhile for them. But one of the problems is to develop a certain kind of vision which really 
yeah, you could say, what inspires people. That's very difficult. And I, my impression is, and that's maybe the difference with the United States, that inspiring is, let's say, if I may say so, more part of the, you could say, of the, the, the myth of the United States itself, the way people are looking at each other, at, each, at the history of the state, at also at the, the, you could say, the goal or the, 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 the purpose of the state and of the, 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 the United States as a population in itself, than in Europe. I, I, when I was still working, you was mentioned I worked in mental health, and the, f the thing was that um, if we, go, we went to the United States and looked at psychiatry, that the question always was, in the Netherlands was always, but, oh my goodness, the person is ill, what can we do for him? And here the question was always, oh yeah, he has a problem, it's a challenge, what can he still do? And I remember the first time I came to New York for that, that I went to one of the, the, the halfway houses and then things like that. And I was, rec was uh, received by, uh, by a, a guy. He said, hi, I'm John, I'm a schizophrenic. I'm going to take you up to the roof. And I said, oh my goodness, Mr. Schizophrenic to the roof. Hey, that's going to be a disaster. Of course it was not. It was his job to show me around. And we had to learn from that, from the feeling that even if people are in a difficult situation, if there are great problems, that there is some, you could say, that the way to look at it could be different than just saying, well, okay, we have a problem. You say, well, where's the solution? What kind of solution could be there? I think that's really maybe the history of Europe that we have less that feeling, optimistic, naive in some ways, but on the other hand, also inspiring than in the United States. And it is part of the legend of the state itself to instill that in people and to tell people even if you know rationally they don't have a chance at all, tell them you have one, take it, look for it. And in, that's, that's different, I think, and that, that has to do with the emotion. But the things we are talking about in Europe at the moment, and also the, you could say, the, the backlash, the populist parties, are parties that cater to, you could say, the emotional needs of the people and the feeling that they were in, that deprived of what was dear to them, what's important to them. The feeling of a national identity, the feeling of belonging, the feeling of having to know what is really at stake, that you could control that in some way in your own country. These are things that the, these populist parties, whatever you feel about them, um, are doing and are telling the people and are showing them. Only we know what they provide to them is not a solution. It will the problem make the problems worse. That's really what's, what's, what's worrying me in that sense. But on the other hand, I think, well, I do not have the recipe to tell, to tell people this is the vision, because it's vision, yeah, it should be a certain kind of interaction between the ones who, who um, you could say, the, who give the vision a, a, a form and who tell the story, and the ones who feel that they are inclined to listen to that story. There is, you cannot just put it on people. Then, then it's ideology or it becomes a story of, of the leaders of a nation that has no connection with the general, with the feelings of the population itself. And that is what Europe and the European Union certainly at this moment is not able to do this all, to do. Yeah. Um, I very much recognize what Paul is saying. And we all, I think, envy the United States for the kind of optimistic patriotism that is so much part of almost a daily lifestyle here, different from Europe. And yet, at the same time, I'm, I'm sure that there are similar sentiments that Europeans have more at the national than at the European level, traditions that they cherish, that they would like to uphold even in difficult periods. And so political reform, if and when it comes, to your point, really we can only succeed if it addresses the need of the entire population. And again, I'm not pessimistic about that happening because one of the things that Europe has managed by and large, and certainly the Northwestern country in Europe have managed to do much better than many other countries in the world, is to, for instance, maintain a fairly well-balanced income distribution over time and, uh, re and recognize that, um, to some extent, the inclusive society that has been built over time is worth preserving and worth fighting for. So if reform comes, if it will be successful if it will create the jobs that are asked for if it will address the needs of the new technology and view it as an opportunity and not just as a threat if it will tie into the sentiment that many people have of concern where the world is heading for under globalization 
and transform that perspective into one where they see it as an opportunity for their children rather than as a threat to their children. If Europe successfully taps into that enormous reservoir of knowledge and talent that exists out there, or creativity that exists out there and transforms it to a positive perspective on the economic future, then I think the story may be not as clear and single dimensional as the US one, but it will exist at the level of countries, regions, cities, and there will be a common thread running to it that still ties Europe together in a new interpretation of its past. But it will be a difficult story to compose uh, at, at the central level, and all that we can hope for right now is that the political leadership that Europe is developing now will recognize the need for that reform in addressing also the immediate short-term concerns of so many of the citizens that have now turned away from the European ideal. That is a difficult task, but not an impossible one. I'm just going to have one minute to respond to some of the history questions. Um, yeah, I have another um, positive remark to, which has not been mentioned yet. Uh, one has often pointed to the fact that uh, economic growth has been relatively slow in Europe over the last 10, 20 years. Well, we should take into account of the fact that uh, Central Europe has been integrated in this whole uh, process. And that is an accomplishment without any precedent. Uh, uh, take into account the counterfactual hypothesis. What might have been the case if, we, if the political leaders in 2004 would not have taken the political decision, which was not economically based, to integrate uh, the new members in Central Europe. Uh, in the meantime, defense budgets in the West have decreased by 20%. Let's take into account the positive effects for Europe as a whole, and especially in the Central European countries, but also these positive effects in our own economy. With regard to national identity and European identity, it's true that uh, historians have contributed in the 19th century to the creation or uh, acceleration of the thinking in terms of, um, of uh, national unities and that that has been leading or uh, reinforcing uh, the tendencies towards uh, which, which led in fact to the First World War. Uh, we should not try all too much, I think, to create in the similar way, in the similar way uh, uh, a European history, uh, it has been tried already and it's extremely difficult uh, from top down. But what will happen is that uh, European awareness uh, shall increase by the external pressure. The relevant other will be there and it will not be Mr. Putin, but as Wesley Clark wrote in uh, last weekend's uh, New York Times, uh, China will make us aware of the fact that we need to work together. And that will that external factor will bring us more together, I think. Okay, good. Thank you so much. So much. Now we're gonna have a reception and before we move to the reception, if you're, if you're interested in this, which you could not, not be, there Martin Wolf uh, is visiting at Columbia at SIPA and on Thursday he will be speaking at the School of International Public Affairs from two to four a very different view uh, on uh, the viability of the European <coughs> Union from the British shore. Okay, good. Thank you so much.